Well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin firstly by acknowledging and paying my own personal respects to the Turrbal people whose country we meet on, and also to thank CEDA for the invitation to speak at another of their events here in Brisbane. I have to say, I love coming to Brisbane, and the few times I've been able to do it with CEDA, it's been absolutely stunning events uh, to see so many people taking an interest in the work that they do. And I just want to mention that not only is there this event here, but uh, Kyle's very keen to make sure that the work that CEDA does is engaged with across Queensland, outside of uh, the metropolitan heart, but in places like Townsville. I'll be heading up there to speak to a group there as well. And I just think it's fantastic to see CEDA taking that more comprehensive view of the communities it seeks to engage. Now, last week, in fact, this time last week, I was in Port Hedland in the Pilbara. It was a complete accident that I was there in advance of um, speaking to you today, but nothing could have been a better preparation for the issues that are discussed in the report that CEDA has produced. I'm not sure if any of you have been to Hedland, as they call it, uh, or to the Pilbara more generally, but this is an area of Australia that has produced untold wealth. And yet, when you talk to the community, as I did there, they're fearful for their future. They wonder whether or not they'll be able to sustain their township, not so much when the iron ore runs out, because it's got at least 100 years to run, but whether or not there'll be enough committed members of the community willing to invest in that place in order to sustain it. Why are they worried about that? Well, part of it's to do with structural changes, the introduction of fly-in, fly-out, mining operations where people don't necessarily have the same commitment to a place they only visit for work. But there are deeper issues as well. There are issues to do with the fact that for many people, they're uncomfortable with their children continuing on at the schooling that's provided there beyond the primary years. Why? Because a state government has failed to invest in creating a school environment where teachers want to come and to stay. Instead, it's usually first-year students who have just been released to spend some time in the regions, earning enough points, I suppose, to be able to migrate back into Perth or some of the more settled areas. And so instead of having the continuity of an education system which builds and builds and builds to the welfare of these children, you see the teachers turning over, questions about the quality of the education being opened in the minds of the people who live there, and eventually, beyond primary school, they send their children away to boarding school or they leave themselves, depleting that community. You see South Headland as a place which is riven by problems largely generated by alcohol and some other substance abuse. I think probably a story that's familiar in many regional areas, not just amongst the Indigenous community, but more widespread. But for the Indigenous community there, and this is an absolute national disgrace, Despite the vast amount of wealth which is present in that community, you have people who live in an area called the Two Mile. Our fellow citizens who live without sewage, without water, without food, because they've been displaced from the more settled areas. How is that possible? How is it possible that in 2018 our fellow citizens live like this? Now, the impact of that disadvantage doesn't just affect those who are immediately present in the two mile. It also casts a pall over that whole community. It's part of the reason why there is a dispirited sense amongst the people living in this small outpost of our society. It's why perhaps the council freely admits in its own terms to being dysfunctional. It's why it struggles to see whether or not it has in place the civic infrastructure which can enable citizens to flourish in their own land. And it's a place which, in a sense, writes large, but on a smaller scale, the sorts of questions which we need to address that have been presented to us in this report by CEDA. I'm tempted to think in some ways that the E in CEDA should not just be for economics, but E for ethical the Committee for the Ethical Development of Australia. Because at the heart of the question we need to resolve around inequality are some fundamental ethical questions. 
in the chapter that I've written, I try to set some of those out by starting with the most basic ethical presupposition of all, which is to affirm the intrinsic dignity of every person. It doesn't matter your level of education, your gender, your cultural background, your age, none of these things matter. Every human being is a person, which is a, a moral category of being that has intrinsic dignity, that is never able to be reduced merely to a means to be exploited for economic or political or other purposes. And it's that sense of personhood, of having intrinsic dignity, which is thrown into question when there are large-scale examples of inequality. Just last night on Q&A on the ABC, they spent probably a third of their program devoted to the question of inequality. And Andrew Lee, a Labor member of parliament and a, an economist, he quoted a statistic, and I think I've got it right, that the average difference between a person of reasonable means and a poor person is nine teeth. Nine less teeth, less access to oral hygiene. And you can see it written into the actual structure of people. And if you're one of those people who has nine teeth less, not because you don't deserve to have the same number as everybody else, not because you haven't worked hard through your life, not because you're committed to your society or not committed, but simply because of an accident of a birth, and you live in a society which has its, its, its two miles or people without basic health care, you'd start to wonder whether or not the intrinsic dignity that you claim and which is the foundation for our ethical system is merely a rhetorical commitment. And if only, if only that, then what state of mind you ought to bring to bear in response to the world in which you live. And in my opinion, travelling around Australia and overseas to places like Port Hedland and Brisbane, the cities, the regions, you begin to see what's happening. There is a growing sense in the Australian public that no matter what the statistics show in terms of the net increase in annual incomes, that the disparities of opportunity, and that's particularly the point I come back to, the disparities of opportunity as such, that people no longer believe that the essential bargain on which society has been established in which economics was founded to serve, they no longer believe that this is true. They doubt whether or not people in politics actually care about them or care instead on about the obtaining and retention of power, where citizens just become a means to an end. I'll give you one example of that, not in this state, but talking to a very senior politician who sat down with me one day and said, look, I've, I've got some good news. He didn't quite say good news, but he, his face lit up as he told me this. He said, you know, Simon, we've finally achieved our goal now so that every person in New South Wales is a customer. He expected me to cheer this. And I was appalled. I said, that's terrible. He said, why? What, what, what could possibly be wrong with that? I said, I'm not a customer of the state of New South Wales. I am a citizen. He said, well, what's the difference? What's the difference? The difference is that every ounce of authority exercised by anybody in government comes from the persons who are governed, from us from the citizens. Our relationship with the state is not defined by a set of transactions where we can be present at some times when we're willing to transact and invisible at other times when we don't. There's a fundamental misunderstanding which has creeped at least into that government in terms of the way things are supposed to operate. And people sense that. And they sense that the economic system, as they watch the kind of revelations taking place at the moment in the Banking and Finance Royal Commission, that this is a system, not just a few people, which has become disordered. In the paper, I relate the truth about economics. Its great founding father, at least in the Western tradition, Adam Smith, was no economist. He was a professor of moral philosophy. And his introduction to the concept of economics was not as a system that would enrich a few, but merely as a tool, a mechanism for increasing the stock of common good. While it's true that Adam Smith argued that it would not be through benevolence, but through self-interest, that the butcher, the baker and the brewer would make provision for our dinner, that's true. But he didn't say that that was so that they could just enrich themselves. 
The idea of economics or political economy as it was originally fashioned was that this was a system which would make us all better off. And yet, if you're sitting out now in communities like those in Port Hedland or if you're a person questioning whether or not you'll actually retain your job because of the introduction of new technologies like robotics and AI, you ask yourself, do the people at the top of this tree actually understand that that's what the economy is supposed to do? Do they understand that limited liability and the right to incorporation introduced finally in 1856 through the, a bill enacted in the House of Commons, interestingly by a man called Robert Lowe, who was Deputy President of the Board of Trade and had just come from New South Wales where he'd served on the Legislative Council and equally had been a member of the Sydney City Council. This man came with a sense that the only justification for things like incorporation and limited liability again would be because it would make us all better off. So if you're one of these people who's out there wondering, what will they do about my job? Will technological innovation give rise to, to changes in our society that are not chaotic, not where the burden falls unevenly, but where the transition will be both just and orderly? Will th are those are the kind of people who are running the economy? Are those the kind of people in charge of corporations? And the deep suspicion is no. Because on their daily experience, they see a level of inequality which has become not merely tolerated, but accepted. So much so that one of our great national founding myths, that we're a nation of equals, whether it's been true or not, doesn't matter. It's a great national founding myth. It's starting to wither away in the face of the experience of so many people. And what do they do? They become angry. They become frustrated. Certainly a lot of them become afraid. And you see it in the turbulence that we now recognise in our political system. A collapse in trust in institutions. A rise in the attractiveness of the populist politician. Not just here but abroad. We see Brexit. We saw Donald Trump, a symptom of something deeper. We've seen the same kinds of currents beginning to flow through Australian politics. We see a political class that thinks that the, the electorate is volatile. The electorate's not volatile. The Australian people know what they want. They just can't find it. That's the problem. So they cast around and cast around looking for some kind of alternative. Well, that might seem to you perhaps a slightly depressing picture of the current state of affairs. Um, a political class out of touch with the people, an economic system which is not serving its original purposes, fear, discontent. But that's not where we can leave it. We don't have to leave it like that. We also have it within our grasp, if we want, to address these issues by going back to the core purpose of things. We can ask, what is the purpose of politics? It used to be the most noble calling that any citizen could aspire to hold. We can go back to the purpose of economics as it was originally conceived by someone like Adam Smith. We can go back and understand the purpose of the corporation as originally conceived and debated for almost 50 years in the House of Commons before its legal form was given effect. We can recall these things. And we can go back to some basic attempts to try and redress probably the greatest problem of all. And that is equality of opportunity. And this is addressed in a number of places in, in the publication that's been put together by CEDA. I don't think that anybody actually expects a commitment to equality to amount to sameness. They don't expect everybody to be the same. In fact, I think people glory in the differences that exist between us. And I don't think that anybody seriously expects that a commitment to equality will actually give rise to equal outcomes for all. People recognise that there are variations that are produced by different degrees of focus, commitment, effort. There's a range of things that will make a difference. Some people just don't want to achieve certain ends that others seek to pursue. But what everybody does understand is that everybody should be given an equal chance. They should all start at the same point. And that's the problem. Those children in Port Hedland don't have an equal chance. 
There's no way that they're anywhere near the same place as other people in more affluent parts of Australia. People born into postcodes where they're going to have fewer teeth than somebody a few suburbs across don't have an equal chance. No one could possibly think that they do. Their horizons are circumscribed. The actual opportunities they have are limited. But we, again, can address that. It's about how we allocate our priorities. Our priorities can be based on interventions by governments that seek to redress some of the unevenness that exists across the Commonwealth. So it's a job for federal, state and, ter and local governments all to be involved in these things. It can be addressed by businesses that see that they have not merely an enlightened interest but a broader obligation to ensure that the value that they create, drawing on all of our talents, our natural capital, our social capital, that they see that replenished in the places in a more even form. All of this is possible. Why do it? Well, there'll be some people who'll say, well, you know, it's good for business. Good ethics, equitable business is good business. Yes, it may be. In fact, the evidence universally seems to show that to be true, that you will, in fact, derive better dividends, better performance from workplaces which are harmonious, from societies which have got strong levels of social capital. But is that the reason to do it? Or is that in some ends ultimately an illicit and self-defeating reason? Because it's so shallow a reason that it's easily set aside if ever the economic equation seems to suggest a different answer. I think it's not a good enough reason. I think what we need to do is to recognise that that foundational point with which I began, that the intrinsic dignity of every person, that our status as citizens is the reason why we ought to commit to this different type of economics. All of the resources we need to be able to do that are within our grasp. The intellectual foundations are there. The systems that we need of relatively good governance can be tweaked to the point that they deliver. But we just have to be prepared to see where the inequities exist and not seek to create some utopian fantasy in which everybody ends up being the same but take that modest step of ensuring that everybody at least has an equal starting point. Thank you.